please go ahead and get out your, your Bible and your workbook. Hopefully everyone's got a workbook by now. Turn over to Matthew 22 in your Bible and lesson number four in your workbook. Matthew 22 and lesson four. We want to pick up and try to try to see how far we can get with lesson four. Hope everyone's having a good day. I've been looking forward to today to uh, just to be with brethren and get out of all the chaos and the noise of what's going on in our country and just get encouragement from the Bible and, and, and to learn the scripture. So let's let's do that. Let's do that tonight. Let's learn about the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you for today. Thank you for blessing us, Father, to come together to grow and study, Father. Uh, we love you. We appreciate you. We appreciate this good church and the leadership and all the good things that are going on here. We're especially mindful of our country right now and the time that we're in electing new leaders. Father, we pray that you will just watch over us as a nation, uh, that you will bless the process. Let things be done with integrity, Father. And we pray that your will is done in all things and that we can always fulfill our responsibility as Christians no matter what happens. Bless us, Father, in this study. We pray that you will be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, pick up where we left off. Uh, remember, we are still on Tuesday. We're looking at the teaching of Jesus in the temple, the conflict with the Jewish leaders. Uh, remember, we're, we're going back and forth, really, from Bethany to Jerusalem with Jesus. Uh, this is how Jerusalem looks today. This is where the temple of Herod, Herod's temple, would have been in the time of, of, of Jesus. Uh, the, things we were, the main things we're focusing on primarily uh, to, in this particular lesson is the authority of Jesus, which was challenged uh, by, by the religious leaders, the attempted traps of the religious leaders, and then the part about the, the giving of the poor widow. Remember, we also point out how things are very hostile for Jesus in Jerusalem. Uh, the pot is boiling, boiling over each and every day. Uh, it is going to be a drastic difference from what happens on Sunday when he enters in to what happens on Thursday and Friday in the same week. Uh, the religious leaders that, that are really going at Jesus during this Tuesday uh, and his time in the temple we're looking at the chief priests and the elders of the Jews, the Herodians, who we've talked about, those who had an, an allegiance with the Herod family. And they were viewed as traitors by most of the Jews because the Jews th did not like the Herod family at all. But they formed an alliance with the Pharisees. Uh, the Pharisees were considered more of the, the more conservative Jewish sects. And, and let me just say, with all these little groups here, the Sadducees, the Rhodians, Pharisees, we can put the Essenes on there, the Zealots. All the, you don't read about any of these groups in the Old Testament, do you? Not in the Old Testament. At some point along the way in the time between the Testaments is when these groups started getting formed. Okay? So just re remember that. And then you got the, the scribes, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees. So we've seen in the, in the morning, on Tuesday morning, the apostles noticed that withered fig tree. The fig tree represented Israel and how they were just a fruitless nation and God was going to bring judgment on them. Jesus arrives at the temple. He begins to teach. He's challenged by the chief priests and the elders concerning the authority, his authority for cleansing the temple the day prior. He wanted to know by what authority did he do that. And he combats that by asking them a question about authority, doesn't he? He says, well, when it came to the baptism of John, where did the authority for that come from, from heaven or from men? Well, that was a catch-22 question for them because had they answered it from men, well, everybody would have knew that was wrong because John was a prophet. And if they answered from heaven, which it was, then they would have looked really foolish because they rejected John as a prophet. And so they lied and said, we don't know. And Jesus said, well, I won't answer your question either. I won't tell you about what authority I do the things I do. And the fact of the matter is, when it came to John's baptism and the work of Jesus, even the cleansing of the temple, Jesus and John did their work by the authority of God, by the authority of heaven. But these men, these false teachers, these, 
these, these corrupt shepherds, quote unquote, they rejected the authority of heaven. They rejected Jesus. They rejected John. And this was all, this was all foretold in the prophets. The prophets said this was going to happen. Uh, and then we come to the part we want to talk about today, which is the part about the Herodians and the Sadducees. Okay, so let's look at that. Let's look at that. All right, want to go to question number, I think where I want to go tonight is question number four. Go back to question four, please. We go back to question four. There is this question about taxes. Matthew 22, 15 through 22. You see that? Question about taxes. Should we pay the poll tax? The Herodians, the Herodians of all people, uh, the more political group of the Jews, they asked the question about taxes. This question was designed to be a trap question. So somebody tell me, please, and um, I want to see if you've had time to think about this. How is this a trap question? Anybody got an answer for that? Yes, sir, Lance, go right ahead. And however he answered that, he was going to make somebody, what, mad. He was going to alienate someone. He was going to isolate himself, alienate him, himself from somebody in the crowd. So either he's going to be charged with treason or he's going to be charged as a traitor. Would you say that, right? So should we pay the tax? If I say, if Jesus says, and they're thinking at least, if he says we should, then the Jews are going to get upset because they didn't want to pay the taxes to the Romans. If he says we should not, well, then the, that catches the Romans' radar because now he looks at somebody who wants to maybe start a revolt or something. So how did Jesus respond, somebody? How did Jesus respond to that, to that what they thought was a difficult question, a catch-22 kind of question? Yep. And so she, our sister says they asked him what image was on the coin, and it was Caesar's. Uh, look at Matthew 22, uh, that's verse number 20. So, and I like this because we see Jesus use visual aids. He does this a lot. I mean, he didn't have PowerPoint, <laughs> but he, he used visual aids. He, I mean, when he, when he was teaching about the humility of a child, what did he do? He grabs a child. He teaches the parable of a sower. He, he's, I believe, pointing at a, a man who's actually sowing. Jesus believed. He knew how people learn by seeing visual aids. He believed in visual aids. So he picks up the coin. You got Caesar's image on it. And then he says something just brilliant. Caesar's image on this. That means Caesar's owed something because he's in a position of authority as far as government. So Jesus says to them, you render to whom what is due. You render to Caesar what Caesar's. You render to God what, what is God's. Who can get mad about that? <laughs> can, can the Romans get mad about that? No. He said render to Caesar the things of Caesar's. Can the Jews get mad? No, because they're religious folks. You render to God the things of God. Isn't that a brilliant answer? You obey God either way. You obey God either way. And, I, and that is something, Brother Gary, that I, that I actually wrote down that I want to say something about. Jesus believed in submission to government, even as the Son of God. And Jesus viewed submission to government as a form of rendering to God, if you think about it. So, so whatever they were trying to do here didn't work. It actually backfired big time. Instead of them making him look foolish and trying to alienate him from the crowd, he makes them look foolish and he demonstrates his great wisdom and his submission to the things that are right. God, number one, but also to the government. Rendering to the government was due to the government, which includes even taxation. So their plan totally backfired. He turned the tables on them. It didn't work. So does anybody have something maybe you want to say about that episode that's interesting to you? I, I would give you a chance to say it. Go right ahead, Lance. Really yes, sir. It made me think about expanding it to you render what you, is your wife's, what's due your wife. You <laughs> Which is your, everything, but yeah. Well, what's due your, what's your children, teaching them that I miss the Lord, what's to them. You 
render to your, to your boss what's due to your boss. You render to everybody what's due to them. We render to each other love. We owe, we owe each other love. Uh, so th that's, that's the responsibility of a child of, of God. So those are good, good thoughts. Uh, Brother Kevin and then, um, Don, you have your hand up? I didn't want to overlook you, sir. Okay, let me get Kevin and Don, then we're going we're gonna to go ahead and move it. Go right ahead, uh, Kevin. Right. Right. Absolutely. Done. Go right ahead. And then we'll then we'll get moving to the next part. The, the illogic of the question to begin with, where you could not use that coin in the temple. That coin could right. only be used in commerce of the government or government sponsored. And to, to pay homage to the temple, you had to take that coin and, and convert it. Right. Right. No, it, it, those are all good points. And I think we just see, well, the first group, they, they strike out pretty quick. So, but the thing I want to make sure everybody sees here is they're working pretty hard. They're working pretty hard. So let's move on to the next one. And I want to spend some time, if you don't mind, uh, just saying some things about this, uh, kind of uninterrupted. Uh, I want to say some things about this. Uh, and then there's another question on here I want to say some things about. And then if we have about three minutes or so at the end, uh, anything you want to say uh, beyond that, I'll give you that time. OK. All right. Matthew 22. I hope you read this ahead of time. It's, I put these verses in your book as key scriptures to read before coming to Bible class. So you got Matthew 22, 30, uh, 23 through 33. You got this situation with the Sadducees. The Sadducees. Uh, they are a very interesting group. They are a very interesting Jewish set. So I want to say some key things about the Sadducees. You might want to jot these things down to really understand what's going on here. Because this, you know, one of the things I've learned about the Gospels is the Gospels may be some of the most difficult parts of the Bible to understand. Because it's like an onion. It's layers. It's so many layers of what's going on in the Gospels beyond just the stuff we teach our kids on the surface. When you study the Gospels over and over again, you see so much going on beyond the surface. And that's, this is an example of that. There's a lot of background one has to really understand to be able to appreciate what's going on here with the Sadducees. So the Sadducees, there's some things that really stand out about them that make them different than these other groups I put on, your, on the slide. One thing about the Sadducees is they did not believe in the resurrection. And you, you, you knew that probably. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in the reuniting of soul and body. They did not believe the dead would be raised. But not only did they not believe in the resurrection, when you read Acts 23, when, remember we did some lessons on Paul's missionary journeys. When Paul's on trial before the Sanhedrin, Luke puts in there they also didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in spirits. They didn't believe in the afterlife. They didn't believe in the eternal nature of the soul. They didn't believe in those things. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, angels, spirits, the afterlife. And don't think they looked weird among the people. Most Jews held the beliefs of the Sadducees. That they had a common belief among Jewish people in the first century. They really did. And these things are some of the key differences between them and the Pharisees. Now, Paul understood this. He was a Pharisee for a time, remember? And the Pharisees believed in the resurrection. They believed in the resurrection. And so when Paul was standing trial in Acts 23, before the Jewish council, when he realized he wasn't going to get a fair trial because they had arrested him falsely for a uh, false accusation of bringing a Gentile into the temple. They really arrested him because he was a Christian and he preached the gospel. And when he realized he wasn't going to get a fair trial and he knew he noticed Sadducees and Pharisees on the council, what did he do? He used the resurrection to divide them and get them all focused on him to fight with each other. It's really brilliant what he does. But Paul is very aware of the hostility 
and the various debates that took place between the Pharisees and the Sadducees on the resurrection. Now, let me just say that when it came to these two groups, one of them was right about it and one was wrong. The Pharisees were right. They were right about it. Sadducees were wrong. And Jesus is going to tell them they're wrong. He tells them in this, in this text. So the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. Secondly, they also did not acknowledge the writings of the prophets. They did not acknowledge the writings of the prophets. Another key difference between the Sadducees and everyone else is they did not acknowledge the writings of the major prophets, the minor prophets, the poetic books, which would include Psalms, Proverbs. They did not acknowledge the book of Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. The only books they really took seriously and acknowledged were the Torah, which would be what? First five books of the Bible. That's the books the Sadducees took seriously. And Jesus knows this, which is why when Jesus corrects them, he doesn't go to the various Psalms he could have went to to prove the resurrection. He goes to the book he knows they take seriously, which is Exodus. Jesus meets them right where they are. He doesn't go to Psalms or something so they can argue and say, well, hey, we don't come on. We, we, that's not inspired stuff. He says, I'm going to go where I know you. I know where you think is really inspired in this Exodus. I'm going to take you there. And I'm going to prove tied to you that you don't even understand the books you do take seriously. He proves that to him. And so understanding these things is, under, is critically important, understanding what's going on here. There's a lot going on here. And so the question they come to Jesus with is another question designed to diminish his influence, to isolate him, to, to make him look bad in front of the people, especially the crowd of people who took their view. The question is about the resurrection. The question is, if you have a woman who marries one man and that guy dies and if she marries his brother and that guy dies, and she, we do this seven times, <laughs> okay? Whose wife is she going to be in the afterlife if the resurrection is really true? Now, what they're describing is something that's taught in the Old Testament, isn't it? They're talking about Le Leverite or Leverite marriage. This was something that God ordained in the Old Testament to, to make sure that a man had offspring uh, through his family, even if he died prematurely. So this is something from the law. And they're familiar with it. And they're saying this part of the law, the, the, this part of the law says this. And if the resurrection is true, then how can this be true? So they think they got a trap situation for Jesus. This is what you would call one of those worst case scenario questions. You ever had those questions where somebody comes to you and they say, well, what if somebody just died on their deathbed before they can get baptized? You mean to tell me God's going to put them in hell? You ever had questions like that? That's those worst case scenario hypothetical situations. <laughs> this is a worst case scenario seven times. Really? Really? But that's what they're doing here. It's the same kind of stuff people do today. And so look at verse 29, please. In verse 29, after they come up with this hypothetical situation that's really ridiculous, Jesus says, you are mistaken. And you don't understand the scriptures and you don't understand the power of God. So he says, you don't understand two things that you should understand since you're supposed to be such elite religious thinkers and students of the scriptures. You're supposed to understand the scriptures and you're supposed to understand the power of God. You don't understand either one of those things. Jesus told him that. I like that because it shows me that when it comes to understanding the Bible, people can be wrong in their understanding of the Bible. There's no, well, you got your interpretation and I have my interpretation and that's, we can all have our different interpretations. No, the Bible has one interpretation. And we got to work hard to figure out what that one interpretation is to the best of our ability. And then we got to apply the teaching to our lives. They erred in understanding the scriptures. They erred in understanding one of the books that they believed was inspired, which was Exodus. People can be mistaken in their understanding of the scriptures. I think that's something to emphasize. These people erred. Now, notice also how when it comes to understanding the Bible, not only do we have to, you know, read it and, and, you know, look for application, but we even have to to notice the tense of words. 
the tense of words. Jesus in proving the resurrection and the afterlife, and even angels, by the way, Jesus tells them about Moses. He reminds them of Moses in the book of Exodus, Exodus 3. And how the angel of the Lord spoke to Moses through the burning bush. And when describing God, God says, I am present tense, right? Not past tense. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The implication of that is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were still alive even though they were dead. They still existed in the next life, and God was still their God. The Sadducees missed that. They didn't focus on the tense of the words in Exodus. Had they focused on that, they would have realized that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob still existed. Their souls were eternal, and God was still their God. They missed it. They totally missed it. And so Jesus told him, you're mistaken. You're mistaken on your understanding of this. He exposed their faulty understanding. He exposed their faulty understanding of the resurrection, the afterlife, the eternal nature of the soul, angels. Because notice he says that in the resurrection, verse 30, they are neither, ma they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like what? And the Sadducees didn't believe in angels. Jesus says it's angels. You're wrong. And notice in the next life, we exist, but we're not married. We don't get married in the next life. Mitch and Veronica have been married for a long time, and marriage benefits them in this life for procreation, for companionship. But in the next life, and Veronica may be happy about this, I don't know. But in the next, <laughs> in the next life, they will exist together in heaven but they won't be married because there's no need for marriage in the next life. That makes sense. Marriage is needed now for procreation, for companionship and various things, but there's no need for it in the next life. In the next life, we're like the angels. We don't procreate. We don't have sexual union relationship. We just are in fellowship with God forever in existence. That's the point. So Jesus exposed their, their faulty understanding on angels and even their faulty understanding on God. They had a faulty understanding of God, and they limited the power of God. They put God in a box. They failed to realize that God is capable of not only creating man from the dust of the earth, but he's also capable of resurrecting the man and reuniting the man's soul with his body and putting him in a position to exist even after he leaves this earth, this life. They missed that. And you know what? And I'll just say this. We have brethren in the church, or at least they call themselves our brethren, who believe the same stuff? They're brethren in the church who don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They go to every scripture that talks about the resurrection, and they say that's talking about the church. The church being resurrected out of Judaism. Every passage, they say there's no resurrection. When you die, you go right to heaven. Or you go right to hell, and there's not going to be a resurrection. And they go to these passages and they just totally distort these two. I mean, you're not, you wouldn't be able to go to them and say, what about Matthew 22? They got an explanation for it is wrong. But we're not going to show them a verse that they haven't seen and consider. They just distort them all for their faulty view of the resurrection. The Bible clearly teaches that there, will, that there is life after death and there will be a resurrection. In fact, Paul believed that as a Pharisee and as a preacher, as a Christian, and that's one of the reasons he got so much Got so much trouble because he preached the resurrection, the raising of the dead. So, so th that messed up. That totally just got blew up in their face. And I can just, can, I mean, I doubt when they had Jesus correct them, they were like, oh, Lord, you, 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 you taught us the truth on this. Their pride probably kicked in and they probably left even more angry because they were exposed as not as knowledgeable as they thought they were to the people. That makes sense. Now, one more thing I want to say real quick, and then I'll open the floor to anything you want to say about uh, the lessons tonight. Question seven. Question seven. The scribe come the, the scribe and maybe I should have more accurately put and forgive me for this lawyer uh, verses thirty four. 
Uh, that's going to be verses 34 down to verse 40. The sad, you know, you got the Herodians, they go down. The Sadducees go down and the Pharisees, there's, they heard about this and they heard how he has silenced the Sadducees. And they say, let's, 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 get, let's take a crack at it. So they sent a lawyer. Now, a lawyer at this time is different than how you view a lawyer today. It's not really among the Jews someone who would go into a court and make a case in front of a judge. Lawyers among the Jews were more men who were very skilled in the law. They spent their whole days studying the law, talking about the law, debating the law, teaching the law. Very skilled, quote unquote, experts when it came to the law of Moses. So you got a lawyer, a man who's supposed to be very knowledgeable and spends almost 24 hours a day, seven days a week studying God's word. And he comes to Jesus with a question about what? What's the question? The greatest commandment. Now, that question is interesting because it may be and I think it appears that this was a controversial question, especially among lawyers. This was probably one of those questions where they sitting around having coffee or whatever, and they're just talking about this and debating it. And they all just getting into arguments about it every day. And so the lawyer is like, since this is controversial among us and among the people we're associated with, this is a question that gets Jesus in trouble, too. So they go to Jesus with the question, this controversial question. And Jesus, once again, being our Lord, answers it beautifully. He says, verse 37, love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, soul, mind, soul, soul and mind. And the next commandment is, is, is like it, which is verse 39, love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Isn't that the summary of the Ten Commandments? The Ten Commandments were all about loving God with everything you have and loving your neighbor as yourself. That's the, in a nutshell, is the summary of God's law. And not only is it the summary of the law of God under the Old Testament, guess what? It's also the summary of the gospel. It's the summary of the new covenant. We love God with everything we have every fiber of our being, and we treat our neighbor, we love them like we love ourselves. That's been the standard God has had for mankind going all the way back to Israel. And so that utterly failed. That utterly failed also. But let me just say this real quick. Jesus doesn't just let them off the hook here. Jesus asked them, let me ask you a question. So y'all got so many questions. Let me throw a question at you. I've answered your questions and I've answered them with, with book, chapter and verse. Let me ask you about Psalm 110. Let me ask you about when the Psalm 110 talks about when it says verse 44, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies beneath your feet. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? The question is, how, and I want to make sure I say this right, the question here, and when you look at Mark 12, 35, write that verse down. Mark 12, 35, write that down. I want you to write that down because that tells us that this is happening at the temple. That's happening at the temple, okay? And this question was a, a question about the descendants of King David, okay? Now, in ancient times especially, the descendant of a king was never to be considered greater than the king. And that would especially be true with David. So Jesus says, how is it that David calls one of his descendants, one of his sons, descendant, Lord? How is the descendant of David going to be greater than David? What was their answer to that? <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. We ain't thought about it, maybe. You know how the descendant of David was going to be greater than David? By his nature. The descendant of David would be greater than the great king David because the descendant of David that he would call Lord would be God. He would be both fully man and fully God. That is the only way that the descendant is going to be greater than the current king, which was David when he wrote those words. 
So what Jesus is doing there, let me, let me just say this, please. What Jesus is doing there is he's letting them know about his deity. He does this all through his ministry. Now, people always are like, why didn't you just tell us you're the son of God? Jesus does it all the time. He always claims to be God over and over again. When he talked to the rich young ruler, the rich young ruler said to him, uh, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good except, do you realize you're acknowledging me as God? I'm God. Here, the descendant of David, and throughout the Old Testament, you're familiar with the fact that God promised David that one of his descendants was going to sit on his throne forever. 1 Samuel 7, Psalm 110 is all over the place. The descendant of David will be greater than David. Why? Because his nature will be greater than David. He wouldn't just be a man. He would be God. He would be the ruler over all things. He would be deity. And that made him the Lord even of David. And that's the point Jesus is driving at here. And I don't know if these guys understand this or not. I don't think they do. I don't think they get it. But that's what Jesus is, is, is alluding to, his deity. Okay, so we got about uh, four, five minutes. Let me open it up, and, and what I'll do, if you, if you will let me, uh, when you uh, say something, kind of talk kind of slow, because I'm going to try to repeat it, so everybody maybe in the back, uh, back there can hear it too. So has anybody got any comments? We talked about Sadducees. We talked about uh, Herodians. We talked about uh, the lawyer and the question of the lawyer. We talked about the superior nature of Jesus, even to great King David. Yes, sir, Lance. Go ahead, sir. On that last thing that we just talked about, it's actually really concisely answered, answered in Acts chapter 2, verses 29 and 31. Acts 2, 29 and 31. You're saying that that question is concisely answered there, right? You, you mind if I read that? You okay with that? Okay. I just don't want to take it away from No, me. no. You got Acts 2. 29 through 31, which is a great example because in Acts 2, remember, Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost and he's making the point that Jesus is the Lord and the Christ. Verse 36, that's the point of the sermon. And in verse 29, he says, Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, this is Acts 2, 29, that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God has sworn to him with an oath, to sit one of his descendants on the throne. That's, one of the point. That's the point we made. That's 1 Samuel 7 and, and other places. Uh, or 2 Samuel 7, I forgive me. He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. That's the, that's the very point David is making. Absolutely. Uh, anyone else? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Go right ahead, Brother Greg. Yep. And then basically to use them, you didn't think deeply enough about the law. Because this was here. Jesus, yep. Jesus wasn't summarizing something new, he was bringing something there. This is a this is a Pharisee when he asked him the question, who who were the Pharisees looking for? They were looking for the son of David to come and rescue them. And he asked him a question, well, do you all acknowledge David is talking about his son in this? How can he say this about his son? What would be the new characteristic? And again, proving that they really have Can I say a couple things about this, sir, if you don't mind? Because it's excellent points. How do we study? Do we study just to win debates or do we study to grow, to get good understanding, to grow in our knowledge? Sometimes I think as members of the Church of Christ especially, we sometimes find ourselves studying just to win debates or something. And I'm not saying debates are not necessary at times, but we need to study to grow. And there's always something to, that we can learn and grow better in. Uh, Jesus said in John 9, he came so that the blind might see, and so those who say they see will become blind. Well, he's talking about the religious leaders there. They were blind, really, and they never saw because they didn't have the humility to humble themselves to Jesus. And I also want to say, secondly, that your point, again, your point about 
You know, how do how do I see the scripture? There's all you know, they miss these things. That can happen to us and that may happen to Sean Jeffries. You know, I'm a preacher and I study every day for hours. But even when I go back and read the Gospels now, I'm catching stuff that I missed. Even though I may have read Matthew 20 times, there's always stuff that we should say, I want to go to the Bible and I want to try to discover things maybe I've never seen. I want to grow and I want to always acknowledge I don't have all the answers. These men thought they had all the answers. And Jesus exposing how you're not as smart as you as you think you are. <laughs> and, he's, and, he, and he's exposing that to the people. <laughs> all right, Brother Don, go, go right ahead. These guys are all materialistic. And when they start looking at the law, the beginning with Exodus chapter 20 and continuing through Leviticus and not noticing some of those implications that's in Numbers and especially in the second iteration of the law, which is Deuteronomy. Jesus, quoting from Deuteronomy, quotes the predicate to all of the law which began in Exodus chapter 20. That is the capstone for everything below it. And they totally miss that because they don't make that correlation. They study Torah, ding, 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 like it's a checklist law rather than a spiritual law. And just like the, the whose wife is she going to be? The only reason that was there was to carry them into the promised land and keep the promised land pure as an inheritance, missing completely the great inheritance, which is in heaven. Right. No, th those, are, those are really good points. Well, I think we're going to have to close. Um, there's one more question we didn't get to, but we'll get to it next time. Real quick, is, is, that's, all, that's all that people had to say. I just want to make sure I didn't overlook somebody. Okay, so what we want to do next time is look at question nine. I want, that's won't take long. And then we want to get to Matthew 23, very hostile chapter. We want to look at that. Uh, so thank you for your comments and things, and God bless you.